Carlos Kippel Berger. I was born on Staten Island, right next door to the Gay House. And um, in about 50 years ago, my mother sold my grandfather's, great grandfather's papers to the Butler Library, where two people eventually found them. One uh, was Eric Foner, who published a book, and the other was Don Papsen. Both came out last year, and um, Don Papsen was much more about my great grandfather, so I have been reading that passionately. Out of the audience is my daughter, a great great granddaughter, uh, who was named after uh, my great grandmother Elizabeth Neal, who was married to Sidney Howard Gay. So I heard an awful lot about him when I was young, and I was so happy to have Don write this book. So please, Don, come up and, and tell people more about all this. <laughs> statement. 
In consequence of a recent decision of the New York Anti-Slavery Fair Association, you will receive herewith a check for the net proceeds of the sales made at the fair held in December last, with three months interest thereon. Also, $16 proceeds of sales made more recently. And this is what's significant. It has been agreed by the society that Louis Napoleon should receive $100 for his services in aid of fugitives during the present year, 1857. Of this sum, he has received $16. Now, I wanted to, to share those two things with you because I could possibly not remember. <laughs> I'm going to, I do have a prepared remarks, but uh, we're limited on time, so I'm gonna do the best I can to include everything that of significance that I want to share. Uh, Ted um, kind of put a little bit of panic in me uh, on the phone because he said, I want you to put a Greenwich Village twist on your presentation. And I thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to do that? Because our book is about the city. It's about New York City, it's not about Greenwich Village. And then I remembered that there uh, was a letter that Sidney wrote to his friend Edmund Quincy in Boston after he and Elizabeth were married. And he told him that they had rented two rooms on 12th Street. And he said they were living with uh, the Craig family, and that they were kind Unitarians, and mm -hmm. that um, they were favorable to anti-slavery. So um, uh, Otis did a little research, and she found out that where the Craigs lived was probably where New York University is today. The problem with that is that um, the woman who lived there was a widow. So that wasn't a family. So I did a little more research. And then I found that in 1846, there was a man named Thomas Craig who lived at 122 12th Street with his wife Isabella and their son William. And I suspect that that was probably the family that Elizabeth and uh, uh, Sydney uh, had their rooms from. That doesn't really tell us about the Underground Railroad, though, because we don't have any evidence that the gays were involved in underground railroad activity on 12th Street, or that the Craigs were. So then I remember that in Secret Lives, we have a little bit of a story, which we didn't really fully research. If we had researched everything totally, we would never have published the book. Yeah. At some point, you would have to say, okay, we're gonna stop now, and we're gonna go look out. It's the story of a woman who escaped from Richmond, Virginia, in 1855, in April. The story was uh, in the newspaper first uh, uh, through the auspices of the Evening Post. And they said that the woman had been owned by someone who had hired her out, and that the woman had said, I want you to come to see me, and the woman had gone, uh, was on her way to see her, but that there were some free uh, uh, black people on the Jamestown steamer, and then one of them induced her to uh, stay on, on the steamship and to come all the way to New York City. And that she was taken in a hack to a colored family on Sullivan Street. Um, Sidney Howard Gay repeated the story that was in the Evening Post of the Standard, but he added a few corrections. Because a man named Mr. Drum, who was the second steward, on the Jamestown, visited Gay in his office. And he said that the woman's name was Harriet and that she had a child with her. And he also said that uh, when the captain, Captain Parrish, discovered that Harriet had escaped, that he hired the same driver who had taken her to Sullivan Street to take him to Sullivan Street. But he also went to see a deputy marshal. And he, so he took police with him. But when they got to the house, uh, and Parrish tried to persuade her to go back to the ship and to pay for her passage, the, the people who were in the building surrounded her and would not let her go. In order to get away from Parrish, she, she leaped out a window into the yard. Um, now that's very interesting, but who were the people who lived in the house and where was the house? Okay, so I did some research on census records and in city directories, and I found that there were a number of people living at 78 Sullivan Street. 
The man who owned the house that was worth four thousand dollars was a brick house, seventy-eight Sullivan Street. His name was Moses Shepherd. He was a black man, and he um, was a steward. Um, and there was a man living in the building whose name was John Napoleon. I've seen John Napoleon another time, many times, and I don't know his relationship to uh, Lewis, if there was a relationship. But there weren't that many people named Napoleon in the directories in, in, uh, in New York City, so I suspect that they were related. He could have been uh, the Lewis's son, I don't know. Okay, um, now, I'm going to say a little bit something about the Jamestown because it was built in New York City in 1853. And uh, I found an article in a Richmond newspaper which gave the name, the last name, of the man who escorted Harriet off of the Jamestown. In the, uh, uh, in the article in the Daily Dispatch in Richmond, Virginia, it says, uh, the captain saw her go ashore at her destination and having settled his business, the steamer came on to New York. And shortly after she was at the wharf, a Negro named Johnson, who was employed as cook on board, was seen most gallantly escorting her up to the street to a hat, which was driven off before the captain could interfere. A pursuit was made, and the parties traced to a house on Sullivan Street. Okay, I didn't give us his first name, but I did find that there was a man named Henry Johnson, who lived on Sullivan Street at another address. So it could have been him. So that's a little Underground Railroad twist for Greenwich Village. I don't know if any of you have ever heard that story before, but uh, it's a wonderful story, and it's yours. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm going to uh, talk now about the unlikely alliance of Sidney Harvard Bay and Louis Napoleon. I say that it was unlikely because um, their backgrounds were totally different. Uh, this is the cover of our book. You see we have a subtitle, uh, Secret Lives of the Underground Railroad in New York City, but Sidney Howard Gay, Louis Napoleon, and a Record of Fugitives. Because Sidney Howard Gay wrote the accounts of people who came through his office in 1855 and 1856. There are accounts of over 200 people. The last time a record was published of this significance was 140 years ago. Um, and nobody had ever written about Sidney Howard Day or Louis Napoleon. We don't know what Louis Napoleon looked like uh, because there are different accounts of him. So I have a fair skinned man and I have the silhouette of a dark skinned man because he was described both ways. This is Isaac Hopper. Isaac Hopper was an underground railroad agent in Philadelphia in his 20s, then he moved to New York City, and he was Sidney Howard Gay's underground railroad mentor. And uh, in 1846, uh, uh, Isaac T. Hopper assisted uh, Louis Napoleon in the case. It was a very important case. Even though Louis Napoleon was not an educated man, he could not read or write. He had to sign his name with an X on legal documents. He knew the people to go to for help. And so in 1846, when a young man, 18 years old, um, uh, stowed away on a boat on the Mobile to New York City, uh, Louis Napoleon found out, and he went to Isaac Hopper, and he said, I need help for this man. Isaac Hopper said, I want you to go to see Elias Smith. Elias Smith was working at the anti-slavery office with uh, uh, Sidney Howard Gay. So Napoleon tells him about uh, uh, George Kirk. His name was George. He didn't take the name Kirk until after the case was over. Kirk was his father's name. Somebody asked him later, why, why is it that you took the name Kirk and said, that's my father's name? Um, anyway, Elias Smith said, okay, we're going to go see Hopper. So they both went back to see Hopper. And Hopper said, you need to go to see Judge Edmund, Edmonds. Well, Judge Edmonds, uh, you see what happens is that in those days, you could sign a writ of habeas corpus and you could start a legal procedure, and then uh, the person would be uh, hopefully declared a free person. And that's what happened with uh, George Kirk. Uh, the judge declared that he was free. But the captain of the boat, Mr. Buckley, didn't like that. So he went to the mayor of New York City, whose name was Mickle, and Mickle uh, said, we'll have him rearrested. So 
there was a chase in Lower Manhattan to try to rearrest uh, George Kerr. Now, Elias Smith and an architect whose name was William Johnson pretended like they were part of the mob and they steered uh, George into the anti-slavery building which was on Nassau Street. Well, Gay was the, really in charge of this whole operation. By the time it was over, he was totally exhausted. There were a number of people involved, but he was, he was really in charge of the operation. How in the world were they going to get him out of the building? They came up with the idea of putting him in a box. So there was a sugar refinery on Duane Street. It was owned by Dennis Harris. Dennis Harris sent over a box. They had uh, George climb in the box. They nailed it shut. They put a, a tag on it uh, to Reverend Ira Manley, Essex, New York. Well, that's thrilling to me because that's in the Champlain Valley where our museum is. So apparently they were attending to send him to Essex, New York. And it said, this side up with care. Well, the police have been watching the building all this time, and two of them uh, uh, were suspicious, and one of them said, open that box. So they opened the box and they found George inside. So George was put back in the tombs. The tombs was the detention center, and it was located where the civic center is today, in the Five Points area. It was really an ominous building. Um, anyway, Edmonds declared that he was free again. And he was in the tombs, and the abolitionists were concerned about how they were going to get him out. So they went together, and they uh, had him go out the side door, because there was a mob waiting for him to come out the main entrance. They got him out of side, uh, side entrance, and they put him in a carriage, and they took him off to Boston, where he learned to be a shoemaker. Uh, this is Oliver Johnson. I have him here because he was a Congregationalist minister. Reverend Ira Manley was a Congregationalist minister. <coughs> Oliver Johnson was a close associate of Gay's, and he was a Congregationalist as well as an underground railroad agent. He once uh, sent somebody up to Ferrisburg, Vermont. And uh, this is a suspicion. We don't know this for sure. But I'm suggesting that it's possible that uh, Oliver Johnson suggested you know, sending uh, uh, George Kirk up to the uh, Champlain Valley. This is an uh, image of the tombs. OK, now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Napoleon, because um, Napoleon became well known to uh, Isaac T. Hopper and to his uh, daughter, Abigail Gibbons, and her husband, uh, James S. Gibbons. Abigail and um, um, James were both involved in underground railroad work. And in our book, we have uh, some records that were after the record of fugitives. And uh, uh, Napoleon was given some money, but, uh, and uh, the, the Gibbons were involved in that. But what I want to share with you right now is the story of a woman and a man who were married in the Gibbons' home in 1845. Um, her name was Sarah, and she was a fugitive from, from slavery. And uh, Abigail wrote a wonderful letter, which we have part of in our book, about how, how excited she was to be a free woman and uh, how wonderful the wedding was. Well, 10 years later, James received word that Jacob, Sarah's husband, had betrayed her. And the slave catchers were after her. So Napoleon was engaged to have Sarah uh, and the children taken to Syracuse, New York. Um, Lucy, on the uh, left, I don't, know there, I don't know if you have a thing on this or not. Yeah. OK, this is Lucy. I'm getting very good about where I wanted to go. Here, Lucy's <laughs> on the left. Her brother, William. William died at a very young age. Uh, Abigail and their, uh, and their other two daughters and uh, James Gibbons. The reason I'm showing you this image is because Lucy wrote a romantic novel called um, Rachel Stanwood, a story of the middle of the 19th century. Uh, she used her married name, Lucy Gibbons Morse. It was published in 1893. Rachel Stanwood is a thinly uh, disguised biography of the underground railroad work of her parents, of her grandfather, Isaac Hopper, and of Louis Napoleon. 
And this is where the confusion comes in about what he looked like. Because in the book, she says that he was a light mulatto employed in the service of the anti-slavery office. And then a little bit later, she says, he was a middle-aged, dark mulatto man. So we don't know. We don't have an image of him. We haven't found one yet. It's hard to believe there isn't one of them. Because he lived until 1881. Um, if someday we find an image of him, then we'll solve, solve the mystery. But he had an underground railroad friend. His name was John Zuley. And John Zuley and Napoleon used to work together. And I think this is probably the most accurate description, because Zuley said he was cold, black African, and as great a genius as the emperor of that name. Now, in Rachel Stanford, it suggested that he, his name was Napoleon Lewis, and he had reversed the word. Uh, I don't know if that's a fabrication of Lucy's or if that was Lucy's. Uh, there's no way for me to know that. Okay, I'm going to talk now about Sidney Howard Gay. Uh, Sidney Howard Gay one time said that my ancestry is the best part of me. And he and his descendants are very proud of their New England ancestry. On his father's side, he was descended from a founder of the Plymouth Colony. On his mother's side, he was descended from John Otis, who settled in Hingham, Massachusetts in 1635. So Napoleon and Gay grew up in very different worlds. You see, Napoleon was born to a woman who was enslaved. He was born in 1800. In, in uh, the year before that, New York passed a law saying that children born to enslaved women would have to become indentured servants. If it was a female child until she was uh, 25 uh, years old, and it was a male child until he was 28. Well, Napoleon was indentured to Mrs. Miller, who had a tobacco factory, when he was 14 years old. When he was 23 years old, a philanthropist purchased his indenture for $250, and immediately sold it to Napoleon's first wife for $50. So he lost $200 on the deal in order to free this man. Well, Napoleon said that he immediately started rescuing people from slavery. So you see, Napoleon knew slavery, but Sidney Howard Gay did not. He had to, he had to uh, come to an understanding of the evil of the system, which he did. Sidney had a very sensitive constitution. He was ill quite, quite frequently. His father wanted him to become a lawyer and take over his legal practice, so he sent him to Harvard University when he was 15 years old. But he came, became very ill, and he had to drop out. His father expected that he would go back to Harvard, but he refused. He didn't want to go back. He wanted to be a businessman. So he borrowed money from his father, and uh, he uh, went to St. Louis, Missouri, where he said he squandered the money. Then he met a man and said, hey, let's go to St. Louis, and we'll start a trading business between uh, St. Louis and, and, um, and, and uh, New Orleans. So they went down to New Orleans. Uh, on the way uh, uh, down to New Orleans, uh, he observed, I think he was influenced by the slave owners who were on the voyage, because he wrote a letter to his mother, which was a letter of apology for slavery. It's not what you would expect from an abolitionist. This letter is not in our book, because I didn't know about it until last year after I met Otis's cousin, Bess Hughes, because she inherited some letters which she had never read. So my wife, Vivian, and I went to Hingham, Massachusetts, where I spoke at the uh, Old Ship Church. And uh, Bess came. We stayed up until 11 o'clock <coughs> looking at these letters. And one of them was really powerful. Uh, this is uh, Best Peace of the Center, my wife is on the right, and the minister of the Old Ship Church. But I, what I want to share with you is that uh, <coughs> something from this letter. Sidney Rose was to his mother and said, morally and physically, that the slaves were a better class of people and happier too than their free brethren of the North and East. They are better clothed, better fed, better lodged, and in every way more comfortable. 
that even the lower class of place with you have less actual labor to perform and are well trusted by their masters. It makes my blood boil, northerner as I am, by birth, by education, and by feeling to look upon the cause these mad fanatics are pursuing, which may result in a disunion of the state, civil war, anarchy, the downfall of their country. This is pretty powerful, uh, coming from somebody who became one of the most significant agents of the Underground Railroad in the United States. He's very young. He's 24 years old. He's very naive. He really doesn't understand what's going on. Well, saying these things didn't help him get any business because he didn't get one plane in New Orleans. So I guess the Southerners didn't trust him because he was a northerner. What he said, or whether he said that he was in favor of slavery or not. He had to beg his father for money to uh, get back to Hingham, Massachusetts. And today, you, this is hard to believe, but he actually kept the receipt. And it's in the collection at Columbia University, $60. It cost $60 for him to get back from New Orleans to Hingham, Massachusetts. And that receipt is there on the records. Um, you see, Napoleon was illiterate. But he knew from his birth that slavery was an evil system. But Sidney had to come to that idea. He had to learn the truth. Um, in 1844, Sidney fell in love with Elizabeth Johns Neal. And he courted her with some beautiful letters. Uh, Tom told me, Tom Clark, my collaborator, he said, you've got to cut some of that because it's too much, you know. I mean, he loved her so much. And the letters are just wonderful. So um, at any rate, he had to prove himself to her. Because you see, Elizabeth uh, came to anti-slavery uh, as part of her inheritance because her father, Daniel Neal, was very involved uh, in the Underground Railroad work and anti-slavery work. And then she had a grandfather who was uh, a Quaker, uh, and he had uh, freed some of the first people that the Quakers had freed in the history of the United States. So uh, anti-slavery was her birthright, and she had gone to London in 1840. Her parents had sent her to London for a world conference on slavery. So what happened is that Sidney Howard Gay returns home, and he's very depressed. He is depressed because he has failed himself, and he's failed his father. He had told the family, I'm going to make a success in, in, in New Orleans, and it will benefit the whole family. But he came back uh, threadbare in New Orleans. He started teaching a uh, uh, school, and he kept uh, notebooks, and the notebooks are from the University of uh, the accounts of the students that he was teaching. But he became very depressed. He became very depressed. And he wrote to Elizabeth, and he explained the transformation that he went through. I want to share that with you. I crept into my shell at home, morose and dissatisfied with the world, and saw nobody, and went nowhere, but passed winter in study and reading. That winter, 39, a change came over me. I was removed from the temptations of the world, its vanities, and I was led to thinking much of the severe discipline and cultivation which my mind was undergoing in a corresponding change in my views of life and duty. The change was very great, and among other things, I was led to think of abolition, which when thought about all before, I had opposed. And that spring, I announced myself to the astonishment of all the family and everybody else who had known me for years, but had not known what had been going on within me those few months, an abolitionist. You know, it's one thing for somebody to adopt somebody else's uh, 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 way of life, but when somebody looks within themselves and comes to their own realization of what they need to do, that's when it really sticks. And Gay never, never stopped uh, having this commitment that he started having in 1839. Now, Otis uh, has reminded me, I, I want to say that I think Neil, if you remember, you sent me an email and said that this was the most powerful thing in the book for you, this transformation of your great-great-grandfather. You may have forgotten, but I have been <laughs> <laughs> uh, At any rate, um, Sidney had a difficult time pers persuading Daniel Neal uh, to 
uh, agree to uh, Elizabeth marrying him. Uh, but uh, finally, Daniel O'Neill did agree, and they had a Quaker wedding, although, um, according to Quaker tradition, she had to actually leave uh, the faith uh, when she married outside of the religion. Um, in 1844, um, Gay was uh, sent by the American anti slavery Society to New York to become editor of the National anti slavery Standard. He had started writing anti slavery articles for the Hingham uh, newspaper that he had joined the American anti slavery Society. And he, he kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, was proving himself, so they invited him to come to New York City. He didn't really like New York City. And, and so they, they were able to buy a house in Staten Island. They really wanted to be uh, more of the country. Um, as I said earlier, Otis and I have had some wonderful conversations. And uh, some, one story that we both have heard, that she heard and that I found in my research, is a story about a time when Elizabeth came to the National Anti-Slavery Office, and Sidney, who smoked a pipe, kind of motioned with his pipe, and he said, look under the table. Well, there was a table that had a green cover over it, and uh, Elizabeth lifted the cloth, and she saw two men and a woman huddled underneath the table, hiding. Years later, their daughter, Mary Wilcox, hired a servant. And she asked the woman to tell her something about herself. And she said that she had escaped from slavery, and they had been hidden underneath the table. And Mary said, did it have a green cloth on it? And she said, yes. Mary hired the woman that her father had hidden years before. Those kinds of things you can make up, you know. I mean, it's just to be going when you come across something like that. So that's a story that that, um, that Otis heard. It was uh, given to the descendants, and it, and it is at Columbia University, too. Mary Wilcox also uh, wrote something, uh, and she said that, um, um, Sydney's pro-slavery, about Sydney's pro-slavery letters. And she said, he speaks of slavery, but which he had the usual attitude at the time, and even alludes in terms of ridicule to the abolitionists. But in New Orleans, brought face to face with existing conditions, doubt entered his mind. He was invited to make a visit to a plantation and was a little startled on being given a loaded pistol before starting as protection against the Negroes. And he asked, if the slaves were contented and happy, why was it necessary to arm in self-defense? Mary uh, was a little bit in error on this, because this is actually from a short story that uh, Sidney worked on. He called it A Tale. And the incident really occurred in Charleston, South Carolina. I looked at that again today, and yes, it, it was Charleston, South Carolina. He was sent to Char South, South Carolina uh, when he was ill, when he was very young, to stay with relatives and re uh, uh, recover. And it's possible that that's where this, the germ of this idea for this story came from. Sidney was often very exhausted from the stress of putting out the standard on a weekly basis. Uh, he operated on a shoestring budget. There was never enough money. And he never knew uh, at what time of night or day more fugitives would arrive and how he would come up with the money in order to take care of them. His health was a constant worry for his wife. But fortunately, there were other abolitionists in New York City who were assisting people with the image of Otis. Uh, I want to say a little anecdote about Otis. Otis recently celebrated the 92nd birthday. Anti-Slavery Society in 1833. 
But in 1840, the Tappans uh, left that organization and they started a rival organization, the American and Foreign Allies Labor Society. They didn't like uh, Garrison's uh, dislike of politics. They didn't like how he was raising women in the movement so that they would be able to speak in public. Uh, and they uh, uh, didn't like his uh, anti clericalism um, That means that William Lloyd Garrison was very sensitive to the fact that many, many churches and clergymen supported slavery. So he wanted nothing to do with religion, but the Tappans were very religious. They were uh, Presbyterians. What I want to say at this point is that Louis Napoleon was a free agent. So even though uh, Sidney Howard Gay and Louis Tappan didn't get along, Napoleon was able to work with both men. And there was a case in 1853 when Napoleon was with Louis Tappan and a police officer when the prostitute Rose Porter, a.k.a. Rose Cooper, was arrested for allegedly kidnapping a nine-year-old black child named Jane Trainer. And Tappan succeeded in having the girl return to her father. Okay, this is an image that Sidney Howard Gay published in the Standard, and it's a celebration of the, uh, the return of James Hamlet. James Hamlet was a black man who had escaped from the South. He was working as a porter in New York City, and uh, he was arrested and whisked off. Actually, I said uh, to Maryland, he was actually taken back to Maryland. His wife, and children knew nothing about this. He was the first person under, uh, after the, uh, the uh, Fugitive Slave Bill of 1850 was, was passed, he was arrested under that law. Well, there was a rumor that his wife had died of a stroke, out of shock. And uh, black folks in New York City had a big meeting and um, they started to say, well, you know, is it really true? Did she really die? You know, is there anybody here from Williamsburg, from Williamsburg who could tell us? Well, it turned out she really hadn't died. Sydney had, had reprinted something from, from another newspaper that she had died, but she actually hadn't. And at the meeting, they said, alive or dead, the money we raised tonight is going to her. Well, they raised $800 in order to purchase James Hadley, and he was brought back to New York City. So Gay publicized this triumph in the Standard, and Louis Tappan published a little pamphlet about it, and he listed Louis Napoleon as one of the organizers of the celebration for Hamlet's return. And this was, was when uh, Napoleon started getting a little bit more recognition. Okay, I'm going to talk now about the Lemon case. The Lemon case was in 1852, it was a very significant case. This is the other major case that we know that Louis Napoleon was part of. Uh, it was against a New York law for slave owners to bring the people that they owned into the state. Uh, initially, there had been a law that people could bring their slaves into New York up to nine months, but that law was uh, abandoned. Well, Napoleon knew that uh, the Lemons were not supposed to have brought people that they owned into New York. So he signed his ex to a writ of habeas corpus, and uh, Judge Payne ruled that the Lemon slaves were free. Horace really announced that Napoleon placed the liberated slaves in coaches amid great cheering and waving of handkerchiefs and shouts of, thank God, thank God. Um, a black woman was overheard saying that that judge never had to pay anybody to clean this house again. <laughs> Now, there was another faction in New York City. Those were the businessmen who did business with Southerners. And they immediately, within a matter of days, raised $5,000 so that the limits could be reimbursed for the people they had lost. The state of Virginia appealed uh, the, the decision, and they would have taken their appeal to the Supreme Court if it wasn't for the beginning of the Civil War. This is Julia Lemon. She actually owned the slaves, but her husband was the agent in the matter. This is a, a, a history of the case that was published by Horace Greeley in 1860. 
And uh, it's very possible that Sidney Howard May was involved in this project because he was working for uh, for a really at that time. The woman case made Napoleon famous, but it's Ed Gay's record of fugitives and his correspondence that we learned how Gay and Napoleon collaborated. Gay began the first entry of his record on January 21st, 1855, with these words. Two men sent forward by L. Napoleon. On May 27th, he wrote that L. M. had found a man who had concealed himself on a schooner from Savannah, and that Napoleon had sent him at once to Syracuse, a route to Canada. On June 23rd, Gay noted that an imposter visited the office. She claimed to be a fugitive, but they uh, suspected her, and they found out that she was really a destitute woman from Vermont. In spite of that, they arranged for her to go to Hartford, Connecticut. But Napoleon had some trouble with her, and she was dismissed with him. Every once in a while, there would, there would be an imposter. On August 27, 1855, Gay uh, wrote a letter to Philadelphia agent William Still. Still was a man who was sending many of the people to New York City. He advised Still to send fugitives directly to his office. He added, in a few days, however, Napoleon will have a room downtown, and at odd times, they could be sent there. I am not willing to put any more with the family where I have hitherto sometimes sent them. On March 28, 1856, Gay wrote that he had been in Napoleon's home, and he talked with three fugitives, but he had lost his nose. So that tells us that he would take notes, and then some time later that he would write the record uh, of, what, of, of the stories of the people. There are 79 boxes of Gay's materials at Columbia University, and uh, that's an astounding uh, uh, collection. But we have nothing that Napoleon wrote because he wasn't able to write. He wasn't able to read. He had to read people. One of the people that Gay and Napoleon both trusted was John Jay. He was a descendant of the John Jay who tried to have slavery abolished in New York State after the American Revolution was not able to do that. Um, at the anti-slavery office, Napoleon was the conductor. Gay kept the records. He tracked donations and expenses. He reported the cost of lodging the people or transporting them to the next stop. And uh, when uh, his fugitive fund ran low, he had to dip into his own pockets. He was very poorly paid. Uh, there's one letter in which he says, $100 cases are going to break me. Uh, when he was able to, then he repaid himself. In 1855 and 1856, he kept the accounts of the over 200 people that I mentioned earlier. It's an amazing document because he included their enslaved names, their assumed names of free, as free people, the circumstances of their escape, who had owned them, why they had escaped, where they were sent, and how much money was spent to assist them. You don't find records like this very often. This is the first page of the record. This is Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman is here because Harriet Tubman came through the anti-slavery office many times. And the longest passage in the record is of her work. And she continued to come to the office after uh, Gay uh, resigned his post as the editor of the Standard. And his successor, Oliver Johnson, uh, assisted her. This is William Still, who was sending many of the people to Sidney Howard Gay and Louis Napoleon. And my co author, Tom Filarco, was able to look at uh, Still's records and Gay's records and compare them and annotate them. Sometimes there are some differences in names. It's even, it even appears that sometimes a person would change their name between Philadelphia and New York City. Um, this, uh, Jane, Jane Johnson is one of the significant cases in the book. Uh, she was owned by Colonel John H. Wheeler of North Carolina. He was the ambassador to Nicaragua to, uh, to, uh, for the United States. And uh, they were uh, coming through uh, Philadelphia and uh, abolitionists uh, talked with her, and uh, she had always wanted to be free, and so she took that as an opportunity to declare that she was going to be a free woman. Uh, Wheeler didn't like that, and he went to court. He lost the case, 
Van Johnson settled in Boston. This is an image from Still's book about John uh, Thomas Jones. It's one of my favorite stories in the book uh, that we have. I love this because um, he, he escaped uh, at Christmas time. Christmas was a good time for people to escape. Even though it was cold weather, people were given a little bit of time off. Now, Gay says that he really wasn't that unhappy with his condition as an enslaved person until his wife and children were sold. And then he was desperate. Desperate. All he had of his wife was a daguerreotype image of her, a locket of her hair, and lockets of the hair of his children. That's what he had when he got to Canada. He said he wanted to come back and to find them and take them to Canada. We have no idea that he was ever able to do that. I also like the story of Winnie Patsy. Her husband had escaped and she was afraid that her master would sell her. She fled with her three and a half year old child, the daughter, and they were hidden in a, uh, a space that was dug underneath a slave cabin. I like this because it tell us, tells us that the Underground Railroad started on the plantation. Gay wrote, it was entered by a trap door, covered by a piece of carpet, on which stood a bedstead. It had no window, and no means of light or ventilation, except by the trap door. Into this, the mother were, and child were put, and that has been her home for the last five months. She was fed, she says, at the expense of a society among the slaves, organized to aid persons in her circumstances. Gay was somewhat wry when he wrote these two accounts, which I like very much. John had overheard his master say that when he got his corn crop in, he meant to put some of his darkies in his pocket. John took the hint and put himself in his own pocket. Charlotte Nile, a Giles, was well treated, except she was allowed to have no bow which was a drop too much in her cup, and she determined to assert her right to the pursuit of happiness. Although William still published some of his records in 1873, 1872, I'm sorry, he never released his record to the public or took any credit for his underground railroad work. However, Otis's cousin, Bess Fuchs, inherited this eloquent artifact. I would love to talk to Mr. Gay and ask him how he obtained this broken medical. As was mentioned earlier last year, two books came out inspired by the record of fugitives. Uh, Dr. Eric Fulmer's book, A Greater Freedom, came out one month before our book. It's a very different book. It's an overview of, the other, of uh, anti slavery history. He uh, highlights some of the cases from the record. But we have every single word in the record, and we have those records annotated. So our, our books are very different. And uh, you, you, you can only do as well as the information that you have. And uh, uh, it's good that both books are out, because uh, Dr. Foner erred in one significant way. He said that there was not very much on Louis Napoleon. And I found there's a lot about it. It just took uh, for a kind of fine. <laughs> because of the Louis Napoleon. So when you do research online, most of the things you're going to find are about the emperor. Yeah. But there was one newspaper article which said, Louis Napoleon, not the emperor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say a little bit something about the draft rights because Sidney Howard Gay left the uh, anti-slavery standard. He was very, very sick. He was exhausted. He actually left because Oliver Johnson was his associate editor, and the clique in Boston said, we can't afford an associate editor anymore. He couldn't continue helping the fugitives, being in charge of the newspaper, and uh, so he resigned. It took him a while to recover his health, and then he went to work for the, for the uh, Tribune, for Horace Greeley. During the riots of 1863, uh, mobs ransacked and burned houses. They attacked innocent people. They also started uh, fires on the first floor of the Tribune building. And really said, I, I want no armaments on the building. And then he went to there. 
Well, Gay and the men he was working with uh, got guns and ammunition in the building, the type of building. And uh, meanwhile, um, Elizabeth was at home in Staten Island. And she had somebody teach her to use a pistol. She was a non-resistant. Quakers were non-resistants. Non-violence, all right? There was a mob outside of their house. She was there with two of the children. One of the child, children was staying with somebody else. But she had to protect the home. So she learned to fire a pistol. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, there was a tavern keeper down at the corner of Davis Street, and he steered the mob in another direction, so she didn't actually have to use the gun. It was a horrible, horrible time. We don't think about lynchings in the North, but there was lynching in New York City during the draft riot. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Frederick Douglass because he's a threat throughout our book. Uh, originally, Douglass and Gay were friends. They actually lectured together. One time, Douglass asked uh, Gay to help him in a, ma a, a matter of uh, wills that uh, he had with uh, someone in Boston. Uh, but the problem was that Douglass wanted to be an independent man. He decided to publish his own newspaper. And Harrison did not want that. And uh, Douglass went ahead and did it anyway. He also decided that the Constitution was not an, a pro-slavery document. And Garrison believed that it was. So that was another big issue. Interestingly enough, Douglas does not mention Gay's Underground Railroad work, and Gay never mentions Douglas's <laughs> Underground Railroad work. But in one of his narratives, uh, Frederick Douglass mentioned Louis Napoleon. When Napoleon died at the age of 81, his death certificate listed his occupation as Underground Railroad agent. <laughs> the Underground Railroad had been over for years, but that was his badge of honor. When Gay died in 1888, he was working on a biography of his friend Edmund Quincy. Although abolitionists closed the ranks when the Civil War happened to defeat slavery, they never forgot the days when their differences tore them apart. This is Elizabeth Neal Gay, Otis's <coughs> grandmother. In 1893, Philadelphia abolitionist Mary Grew referred to the painful 1840 schism between Garrison and the Tavins. When she wrote Elizabeth Gay, her last letter, I will destroy as you wish. Yes, it is better to bury, if possible, some of those experiences of 1840 beyond the power of memory to revive them. And so it is that some things shall remain a secret. And now I'll take questions.